Please join me this morning in our call to worship. The season of Lent calls us to journey along the edge to anticipate that final trip to Jerusalem. Lent not only calls us to give up something, but also invites us to participate in the mystery of God with us. Our hymn is number 346, Majesty, would you please stand as we sing together. as we pray together our prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son fasted in the wilderness and faced human temptations. Give us courage to face and name our own temptations and to direct our lives in obedience to your Spirit. You know us better than we know ourselves. May we know you and grow closer to the vision you have for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Christian. Good morning, Bryson. I know both of you. I know one of you especially well. Okay. First question. Has anybody ever been in trouble or done something they shouldn't have? There's, a, there's one. Okay, I'll start. In third grade, one of my friends and I, her name was Twana, and we had to return something to the cafeteria. And when we had finished our task, we decided it might be fun to play on this little teeter-totter seesaw thing on the there was a stage in the cafeteria. We thought it'd be fun to play on that, but it was only for kindergartners. And we were in third grade, but we wanted to try. So we did. And just as we were finishing and we were leaving the cafeteria, the principal saw us from the back of the cafeteria. And we didn't hear him calling to us, and so we just ran back to our classroom like nothing was going on. And so guess what happened? I was called to the principal's office. But nothing really terrible happened. So I've been in trouble. We've all been in trouble. There was a man in the Bible, and his name was first Saul, but then his name was changed to Paul. And he wrote to some people in Rome one time. And he said this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I think he probably thought about that. Have you ever done something and you wondered to yourself if maybe God 
wouldn't love you anymore? If there's something that you'd done somewhere along the way that could separate you from God and make God be in one place and you in another. Is there anything, how, how do you think you might separate yourself from God or God from you? Is there any way we could hide? What if you took your camo coat and put some camo pants on and a camo cap and painted your face and climbed in a tree? Could, he would use infrared vision. Ah, he would use infrared vision. He could see your heat then. Is that what you're saying? Mm. Christian, what do you think? Is there any, anything you might do that could separate you from God's love? Well, what if we, like, climbed in a, a submarine, a yellow submarine, <laughs> and went to the bottom of the ocean? Do you think that? Do you think we'd get away from God that way? No? Anything else? Anything interesting we might do? Oh, what about a spaceship? And we could fly to infinity and beyond. Okay. Well, Paul, <laughs> I'm having fun here anyway. <laughs> I agree. Paul even reminds us that nothing can separate us from God's love. He says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, even superhero powers, no powers, neither height, which means way out in outer space, we can't, get, can't separate from God's love, nor depth, ooh, not even at the bottom of the ocean, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So nothing we do will take God's love from us. Nothing. God is everywhere. God is all things good. Now I have a little reminder for you. This is given to us by an angel in the church, and they are gummy hearts. And here's one for you first, Christian, one for you, Bryson. And we're going to read them, read it out loud all together. One, two, three. God has my heart in his hands. Now, here's the key. One for one hand, one for the other hand. One for one hand, one for the other hand. Now, I want you to each to go out into the congregation and give one of those to one person and one to another person. You ready? Three, two, one, go! Da 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 Don't take too long. There we come racing back. God loves us always. And even when you give away, do you get more? You too, young man. And two for your brother. Okay. Let us pray, if you'll repeat after me. Thank you, God, for this day. A reminder of your love for all of your children. Help us, Lord, to go into the world and show your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. The scripture readings this morning come from the New Living Translation of the Bible, Psalm 93. 
The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Lord, has stood from time immortal. You yourself are from the everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Your reign, O Lord, is holy forever and ever. The word of the Lord. This is the time in our worship service where we take our hearts before our God, before the throne of grace, and before we pray, I want to call your attention. You'll notice there in your bulletin that the flowers on the altar are given by Bob Kreider, remembering his daughter, Kimberly, and also honoring the 55th wedding anniversary of Jan and Bob Carroll. Let us go before the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray. O 
Almighty God of love and patience, what a, bre- what a beautiful privilege it is to know that as we gather in this beautiful sanctuary, as we know that we are surrounded by family and friends who love us, who love each other, we know that we are bonded together by the bond of peace, the bond of your Holy Spirit. And Almighty God, during this time of Lent, we pray that you will cause us to embark upon a very serious and sober and dedicated journey, a spiritual journey in which you would have your way with us, with our souls, with our minds, transform our minds that we might grow closer to you and in turn closer with those you have placed in our lives. Almighty God, we do indeed pray for the children around the world and specifically this morning for the ministry, the mission of the Child Advocacy Center. We're grateful for the volunteers who make that ministry happen as you work through them. We pray for those who will be touched even today perhaps by the caring hands, by the caring touch of your son, the great physician, to to have these children know that indeed they are loved. We pray for the associate pastor search team as we are in your own timing. They're going to be bringing in not one, but two new pastors in the life of this church. So we, we pray boldly realizing that you already have exactly the right pastors in mind. We pray for your wisdom and your guidance for that team. May you encourage them and give them your wisdom. We pray for those who are not able to be here this morning. They're not able to get out of their houses for whatever reason. They may be in a a a caring facility. They would love to be here, but, but they can't make it. They're here in spirit. We pray that those who may feel lonely will, that those of us even here today may feel convicted to go visit them and to call them and send them cards. We pray for the peace of your Holy Spirit upon them. And we pray for those who are in the trenches. We pray for those spiritually who are spreading the good news of the gospel, your son Jesus Christ, the ministries, the missions around the world. We're also grateful for the freedom that we enjoy even in this hour, worshiping without fear of persecution because there are those and their families who serve this country of yours, even willing to pay the ultimate price for the sake of our freedom. And now of this time we pray that you will give special attention as your children gathered in this sanctuary join together as one body, the body of your son Jesus Christ, with one joy, with one voice, We pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue to worship the living God through our tithes and our morning offerings.
Almighty God, we present to you these tithes, these offerings. It is our prayer that the wisdom and the power of your Holy Spirit will see to it that these resources are used wisely and powerfully, that lives will be touched, minds will be transformed, and those who are in need may sense the healing touch of love, the touch of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 702, America the Beautiful. The second reading this morning is a letter from Paul to the Ephesians, verses, uh, chapter 4, 17 through 32. Living as children of light. With the Lord's authority I say this, live no longer as Gentiles do, for they're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life that God gives before they've closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Tell us, let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. 
and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The word of the Lord. I told Mark I sort of like this one here. Maybe Butch Jones could use it, Mark. You might want to hang on to that. Well, a long time ago, way out in the country somewhere, there was this old man, and he was cantankerous. He was crabby. Nobody could stand to be around him. Whenever his neighbors saw him coming, they went the other way. His four sons, as soon as they possibly could, they were gone. His wife, well, she felt like she was stuck with him. So she was the one that had to put up with him. But then one night, one night he laid down to go to sleep, and he didn't wake up. So they called in the four sons, and the four sons gathered, and they said, one of them spoke up and said, well, you know, nobody really liked Dad. In fact, nobody could stand to be around him. Only Ma here, she felt like she had to put up with him. But you know everybody deserves a decent burial. So we need to make sure we go out to the place. You know the place just beyond the field, just beyond the barn, on out into the meadow. We'll find a special place. So they went out to the barn and they grabbed some old boards and they nailed them together and they made a makeshift uh, casket for Paul. And then the four of them each got at a corner and they made their way carrying Paul and they got up to the gate that was next to the barn. And as they were making their way through, it was sort of a tight fit. And one of the sons bumped into the gate post. And with that, he stumbled and he lost his end. And you can imagine the other three couldn't hang on. And down went Paul. And boom, the whole makeshift casket blew apart. And it upset Paul. Straight up. He was alive. <laughs> Turned out that apparently he was just taking a really long nap. So life went back to normal. If anything, Paul was even worse, more cantankerous than ever. And the sons made sure they got away. The neighbors were warning each other. But again, the wife felt like she was stuck and had to put up with him for some two years until a particular night and this time when he went to sleep it was for real that this one was the last one so the four sons were called back in and then one of them spoke up he said well you know nobody could really stand to be around Paul nobody got along with him at all but like I said before, really, we need to make sure anybody deserves a decent burial. We're going to go out there beyond the field, beyond the barn, out over into the special meadow. So they picked Paul up after they made another one. They picked Paul up, lifted him on his shoulder. And as they were heading out, Ma jumped right in front of him and said, well, wait a minute. Make sure that you are very careful when you go through that gate. <laughs> that one has to sort of marinate a bit before. <laughs> so when he was remembered, we have a vivid picture. We didn't know him, but apparently, unfortunately, it's sad and it happens sometimes He's not greatly missed after he's gone. The question, I guess, maybe would be useful to ask ourselves is, 
What will people think of us when it's our last nap? Will people miss us, miss our kindness and our gentleness, or will there be a bit of a sense of relief if people are really honest about it? Now, guess what? This time, I'm going to try. It worked. The cl- I've got a clicker in my hand, so pray for me. I hope you pray for me anyway when I'm preaching. <laughs> but I'm going to try to fly solo. It won't be as good as Mark. Okay, so you have a question. When I, I gave you the a- question, here's your response. You might say, well, I'd like to be remembered as kind and forgiving, but I have this one particular relationship I simply can't get along with this particular person. How can I put it? Let's just say that this person is difficult. And some might say, like that wife, God bless her, I'm sort of stuck dealing with this particular person. What do you think? The scriptures have to say about such relationships. Let's see what Paul says. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Have you ever been caught up in a situation? Now, trust me, I do realize that generally speaking, you're a very sweet and mild and patient person. So we have that out of the way. However, has there ever been a time in your car, confession, if nothing else, has there ever been a time in your car or any other time when you allowed yourself to get angry and then it festers and then it festers and then it gets so wild that you can't even hardly rein it in? You're saying, no, but I sure hope he's listening or she's listening next to me because that person really needs to hear this. Well, I used to, in a previous church and in a previous church before that, I used to be involved in a great deal of marriage counseling. A lot of times before marriage, because I did a lot of weddings, And then sometimes, not even so long after the wedding, I would see them back in my office. I say them, but it really wasn't them. It's interesting how you think of marriage being a team, a relationship, and then when there's a problem, you would think, but it's not the case. Usually I'd open the door and say hello, and I'd say, Where's he or where's she? Where's the person you've been concerned about? Nowhere to be found. So the person sits down and I'm talking and I'm trying to be nice and very sincerely interested, of course. But I'm thinking the whole time, now wait a minute. You've already told me before you got here. Now you're getting into the idea of saying how much of a problem this person is, but the person's not even here. So then I think to myself, of course I'm still listening while that person's talking, but I think to myself, What am I to do if supposedly the real problem is the other person, but the other person isn't here? So I read about this idea, and I employed it. Now, the success of it we'll talk about in just a minute. And here's what it was. I would get a pad of paper, draw a circle on it, and I would say, this is a pie that represents all the conflict in your marriage. It could be any relationship, by the way. Now, 100% of the blame is that pie because that's where all the conflict is. All that to say, I would draw a big circle and I would say, picture this. Everything that is considered problem, conflict, it's represented by this circle. And then I would go from there. I would give the person the pen and say, I want you to draw a slice of pie that you think represents your responsibility for the conflict. Question, how big of a piece of pie do you think that person generally sliced? (laughs) The size that some of us realize we should be eating uh, at a particular meal. They would draw a very small slice, of course, because it just has weird coincidence. 
Because it's always that the majority of the pie, the huge majority, represents the other person's big fault, that person's responsibility for the conflict. So, I talked about that. Pastor Perry says, so why don't you and I talk about the one piece of pie? Let's talk about this piece that is your responsibility. Let's talk about your slice. Why was I trying to do that? Why was I saying, I mean, there's so much more to work with, it looks like, with this big part that the other person, why is it that I'd say, okay, let's try to focus on this interestingly small piece of the pie that you say represents your part in the conflict? Why did I want the person to focus on that? Because how much luck do you think that person and Pastor Perry are going to have with that big part of the pie that represents the other person who's not even here? The only thing, and that can be a challenge, that I can ever change about in Pastor Perry's life, and again, sometimes that's an uphill battle, is something having to do with what I'm doing or not doing. So I would try to get the person to focus on that person's responsibility for the conflict. Surely something in here that's going wrong is your responsibility. What might that be? Oh, and by the way, I said, let's see if this thing goes backwards. Man, I'm impressed. I got a new toy. Uh, <laughs> guess how successful this strategy was of having me focus on that little piece of pie. I would try as I could it lasted moments and then the person would go all after that big pie like a hungry person at Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, so here's a challenge that we all could take on, not just our little friends, the guinea pigs that I'm talking about here. Here it is. As you experience relational conflict at work, at home with your friends and Pastor Perry, not with Pastor Perry, hopefully, but I need to listen to this as well. Any conflict of any sort, big or small, stop and think about your own slice of the pie. Did that really soak in? That relationship, because I said that earlier, that one that comes to mind, I know we're all good about talking about that big part of the pie that's the other person's fault for this conflict. Are you really willing to focus on that small piece of pie that might be able to be transformed, your part in the situation? Ask yourself, what is in my slice of that pie? Have I taken responsibility for my life, really? Or am I enjoying the blame game so much that it has allowed me to ignore the part of the slice of conflict that is actually my responsibility? In any relationship, if you can ever get each of the two parties to own that person's own piece of the pie, and that's a big if. You can make progress, but if everybody is focused on the other person's slice of the pie, you will just have chaos. So, what do the scriptures have to say about what we can do as Christians to have better relationships rather than witnessing the collapse of our relationship to actually see a beautiful building up of that particular relationship. Yes, I do mean that relationship that you've been thinking about, even that one. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, our dear friend the Apostle Paul, instead let the Spirit renew your thoughts and underscore attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and Holy. The key is attitude. You know something I've learned in my few years on this earth? I've learned that there is nothing more important than a person's, other than spiritually, than a person's attitude. And in fact, I think spiritually they go together. And, by the way, our friend Charles Swindoll, ever heard of Charles Swindoll? I've mentioned him before. Excellent author, excellent speaker. Uh, he agrees with us about the importance of attitude. And here's what he had to say on attitude. From Strengthening Your Grip. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts Attitude is more important than the past, than education, 
than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. Attitude is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced as he closes here, I am convinced that life is, hear this, 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. So, as spiritual beings on a spiritual journey called life, what would we say, more importantly, what would the scripture say is the most important character trait we should have with respect to our attitude? What should be right there in the center? Paul says in our scripture today, instead, instead of focusing on that big part of the pie as we call it, be kind to each other. Don't you dream of a world in which more people, more often, would simply be kind to each other? And don't you pray that God will help you, Pastor Perry, to be able to be more kind in my slice of the pie to people around me. I close with this. There was, or rather there is still, a small community, a Christian community in Northern California. And their ministry is the following. They take in precious babies who are dying of AIDS, and they care for them. That's their ministry. And so, there was a television station that decided this is indeed a very important ministry, so we're going to do a feature story on this ministry so more people will know about it. And so they sent a reporter, and a reporter, as often as the case, decided to have an intimate setting, so he asked to speak with a lady who worked there, and they sat down together, uh, and the lady was holding a baby in her arms. So the reporter said, would you please tell me about this particular baby right here? She said, well, this little girl's mother was a prostitute. She was addicted to heroin and she wanted nothing to do with this little girl. And when this little girl was born, she was born addicted to heroin. She was born with the HIV virus in her system. It got quiet like it is now, and the man thought, okay, I'm going to try to be careful with this problem, but he said, please tell me, because you told me, which she did, that this baby doesn't have long to live, why is it that you take in a baby like this and take it back to your community? Without missing a beat, she said, because we want to make sure that this baby experiences the fullness of life. Well, 
At that point, the man was not as careful, not as sensitive, and it was very apparent that he was going with a sarcastic tone as he said, now, please forgive me, but how in the world are we to expect that this pitiful little premature baby is ever going to experience what you call the fullness of life? Then the caring shepherd holding that baby said, this girl, this girl is going to know that there are at least some people in this world who love her. Isn't that the need that everyone has? And if you agree with me on that, what are you, what am I, more importantly, what are we going to do about it? Amen. Our hymn of response is number 640, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Would you please stand as we sing together? Please join me now as we pray together our prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, make me, even me, an instrument of your peace. Amen. And may the perfect grace, the perfect love, and the perfect peace of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.